Hello everyone, welcome to another recommends video. In this video, we are continuing with the second novel of the Hyperion Cantus series by Dan Simmons, and it's called The Fall of Hyperion. There will be a link to a playlist at the end of this video that will contain the rest of this novel, including in that playlist will be the first novel of the series. And this is part eight. Before we begin, if you haven't subscribed, Consider doing so. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and now, part 8. Lee Hunt was watching Joseph die. He had never seen anyone die before. Every time Joseph would cough, he would begin hemorrhaging. Whenever Joseph regained consciousness, he would have Hunt listen and write down everything he said. When he asked Joseph where the core was, Joseph told him that the core is like spiders in the web. At first, Hunt didn't get it, but then he understood that they, the core was in the forecaster system. Joseph, in a moment of clarity, told Hunt to have Gladstone rip out the forecaster network. Later that evening, when Joseph woke up, he told Hunt that Amon and the others are trying to make him escape himself through accepting the godhood to bait the white whale honey to catch the ultimate fly. They want empathy to go into him while he's dying. That way the Shrike can catch it and force it back to the future. Hunt did not understand, but Joseph tried to explain it to him and told him that he is not the one that comes, but the one that comes before. And just before he died, he told Hunt that the Shrike will not harm him. He told him that he may not find a way home, but it wouldn't harm him while he searched. He then gave Hunt instructions what to do with his body once he is dead. Later that night, Joseph died. In the morning, Hunt took his body to bury him according to his wishes. Brawny Lamia finally got to the Shrike Palace. From the outside, the Shrike Palace was only 20 meters across, but from the inside, the space was larger than the valley itself. In the Shrike Palace, there were tiers of white stone upon which human bodies lay, thousands of them stretching off into the distance. And attached to their heads was an umbilical, just like she had. The only difference was these were metallic but translucent. The Shrike was waiting inside. It did not react when she stepped in. She went in and began scanning the rows of bodies, searching for Martin. The first familiar face she saw was Sad King Billy. Then she saw Martin. She went up to him and began examining his umbilical. She had nothing with which to break or cut the umbilical, so she began hitting it with her hand, and that's when the Shrike began moving towards her. She finally hit it with everything she had using the weight of her body. She broke her wrist and smashed the small bones in her hand, but she broke it. A red fluid came out of it, but it wasn't blood. And the part of the umbilical that was still attached to Salinas withered and dried up. Then he opened his eyes and said, Do you know that the Shrike is standing right behind you? When Gladstone got back to her apartment, she had two messages waiting in her fat line cubicle. The first one was from Theo Lane, who told her about the negotiations with the ousters and that they denied that they were the invaders of the web. The second message was from Admiral Lee, showed her a video of when some Marines got onto the ouster ships and they found some bodies. When they tried to cut through them, they began to dissolve. They obviously weren't human and they weren't ousters. He explained that that's the case with all the bodies they captured. They captured none alive. But when he was going to tell her what he thought, that's when his image disappeared. Then General Marpugo came in to see her, protesting the use of the death wand. She told him that they were going to use it, but then she invited him to go for a walk with her. They stepped through her private forecaster to Castro Ruzel. She brought him there so she could speak privately. It had no data sphere, no orbital devices, no human or mech habitations of any kind. She showed him the two messages that she received. Here's where we find out that the two of them have been working together along with the long dead Byron Lamia. He told her that that wouldn't be proof enough for the Senate or the all thing that the core is behind the invasion. 
for she told him it's proof enough for our group. He told her that knowing is useless unless we know where to strike and that they have 2 hours and 42 minutes, which is hardly time enough for a miracle. He goes on to tell her that the core AIs are briefing their technicians on the Death One device and that the torch ship will be ready in an hour. She tells him that they will detonate it where the effect will harm no one, that she has an idea but she wants to sleep on it. She told him that she's going to take a short nap and she suggests that he does the same. Then they step back through the portal. Meanwhile, the consul is still with the Ouster Tribunal. They told him that his wife and child died on Brescia during the war. He told them yes, but it had nothing to do with this. He killed their people because he wanted to trigger their machine to open the time tombs. That's when they told him that the device was useless. It did nothing. It was a test. They told him that they knew when the time tombs were going to open, the decay rate of the anti-entropic fields were known to them. The consul is now upset because he killed four people for nothing. Ousters knew all about him. They knew that his child and wife had died at Ouster hands. They knew that the hegemony had raped his world, so his actions were predicted within certain parameters. And they wanted to know what those parameters were. And the consul said everything was wasted, even his betrayals. Nothing real, all wasted. The ousters passed sentence on him. They let him live. They told him he is condemned to repair some of the damage he has done. He is condemned to enter the age of chaos that approaches. Condemned to help them find a fusion between the separated families of humans. They go on to tell him that they believe that one day the Templars will join them in receding the galaxy. That they have a covenant that governs their lives and actions. Not merely to preserve a few species from old earth but to find unity in diversity. They send him back to Hyperion to help his friends to confront the Shrike and to survive this coming age of chaos. Meanwhile, back at the infirmary on Tor City Center, Father Paul Dure he would become Pope Teleon I. And as he was sleeping, he was dreaming that he was walking with someone, with another dreamer. The young man who was walking with him said his name was John and that there will be one that comes after him, neither Alpha nor Omega, but essential for us to find a way. He told Paul that one will be born far away, further away than our race has known for centuries. Your job will be the same as mine to prepare the way. You will not live to see the day of that person's teaching, but your successor will. Then John told him, you need to leave the infirmary and get back to pass him at once. When Dewey asked why, he said, never mind, just do it. Wait for nothing. If you don't leave at once, there will be no chance later. Then Father Dewey woke up and wrapped a blanket around himself and went to look for a forecaster that would take him home. As Hunt was taking Joseph's body to be buried, the Shrike was following him. When he got to the cemetery, there was a newly dug grave waiting. On the headstone, he found a laser pen that he put in his pocket. After he had buried Joseph, he used the laser pen to draw a drawing that Joseph asked him to. Then he wrote exactly what Joseph wanted. Here lies one whose name was writ in water. When he was finished, he left the grave with the Shrike still standing there. Later at the Colosseum, he found a forecaster, but he couldn't get it to work for him. So while he's standing there in the dark trying to figure out what to do, someone came through the forecaster. Mayna Gladstone was dreaming. Then she suddenly woke up and asked to see the general and the admiral. When they arrived, she quickly took them through her private forecaster to Castrop Rosel. She then told the two of them that she knew where the core was hiding. They were hiding in the forecaster web between the portals. She told them that she got that information from Joseph. So Gladstone's plan is to destroy the Farcaster network. That way they would also destroy the core. She goes on to tell them that the ultimates and the volatiles of the core now have no use for the web. What they will do is keep some humans alive in the labyrinths of the labyrinth worlds. That they have developed the cruciform that could bring back the dead. And after a few generations, humans will be retarded and have no future. 
but the neurons will serve the core's purposes as a computing device. So instead of living in the forecaster network as they are now, they will live in the cruciform. Admiral Singh, who is the third member of their group, refused to believe her, and he pulled his pistol and was about to shoot her when General Mapogo shot him instead. He told her they couldn't take the chance of just marooning him on this planet. They had to do this, and that he will send out the orders at once. Destroying the Farcaster network will take most of the fleet. Then Gladstone said she's doing this all on the strength of a dream, and he replied, sometimes dreams are all as separators from the machines. After he died, Joseph traveled through the Methosphere, the Megasphere, and the Datasphere. He was able to do this without being seen because the major technical personalities were at war with each other. He went down to Tor City Center to the infirmary and into the dreams of Paul Duray. In the dreamscape he created, he was able to convince the priest to run. Next he entered Gladstone's dreams and gave her his message. Next he headed to Hyperion's metasphere and on his way he thought he saw a man being extinguished in the Technicor's civil war. He got there in time to see the hegemony torch ship that was carrying the core Dead One device and he stood to watch and see what was going to happen. Theo, Arundes and the Consul watched as a real-time wideband transmission came in from the CEO. Web-wide broadcast like this had never been done before. Theo and Arundes assumed that she was going to surrender but the Consul was sure that she would never surrender. On the torch ship, Stephen Hawking, General Marpogo had four crew members and that was because they were carrying the core Dead One device. They were headed to the Madhya Farcaster portal while listening to CEO Gladstone's broadcast. She began the broadcast by saying that this is her final broadcast as Chief Executive Officer. And the minute she said that the web invasion by the ouster swarms is a lie, that's when her transmission went dead. So the general and his crew switched to the fat line and they heard the rest of her broadcast where she admitted that the core is behind the invasion, that the core is responsible for the long, comfortable dark age of the soul. The core is attempting to destroy humans and replace them with a god machine of their own devising. She goes on to say, that they have proven that the core reside in the places between the forecaster portals and they believe themselves to be our masters. She goes on to say that she has authorized the force to destroy all singularity containment spheres and the forecaster devices. At this time, the Stephen Hawking had begun the transition. That's when all 263 singularity containment spheres that connected more than 72 million Farcaster portals were destroyed. Thousands of people were caught in Farcaster transit. Many of them died instantly, some dismembered or torn in half. When it happened, the Stephen Hawking was between both entrances and it was proven that the Death One device was detonated in between the Farcaster portals and no one knows what the effect was. So after 700 years of existence, and at least 400 years where few citizens existed without it, the data sphere, the all thing, all communication access band, just ceased to be. Thousands of people went insane because of the disappearance of senses that had become more important to them than their sight or their hearing. And millions of people died when their houses became dead traps because it was only accessible by Farcaster. Bishop of the Trike Church was one of those. Publisher Tyrena Wingreen Fief was trapped on the 435th floor on her office when that happened. And she sat there for 15 hours, refusing to believe her service would not be renewed. Then she called for help and dropped her containment walls so that she could be picked up. But she didn't listen to instructions carefully enough because the explosive decompression blew her out and she fell to her death. It was a four-minute fall. The web economy collapsed and disappeared. Some families were separated 
where the mother and father went off to work on one world and now, instead of just getting home an hour later, would be delayed by 11 years. And some people who had mansions that had forecaster to go from room to room was now trapped light years away from each other. There were riots and looses that tore it apart. New Mecca went into spasms of martyrdom. Tsingtao, Hishuang Pana hung every hegemony bureaucrat that they could find. There were upheavals on every world. And on Passam, the new pope, His Holiness Teliab I, called for a great council where he announced a new era in the church and empowered the council to prepare missionaries for long voyages. On Mars, the Olympus Command stayed in contact with its forces via Fatline, and it was they that confirmed that the ouster swarms had simply disappeared when they intercepted the ships. They were empty. The invasion was over. God's Grove, many tree ships that had survived, left the planet and headed out in many different directions. They made contact with the waiting ouster swarms and began receding. And on Tor City Center, people came looking for somebody to punish. At least 3 million angry people were being held back from the government house by containment fields. Gladstone stepped out through the containment fields to meet the mob against the advice of her people. She knew that the mob was going to kill her, but that's what she was going for. The mob killed her, and the rest of the government escaped via dropships. The consul and his two friends watched as the hegemony fell apart and the web was destroyed. The consul said that the worlds would remain, the cultures will grow apart, but they still have the Harkin drive. He doesn't believe that the core was destroyed. He thought it was merely sealed away, cut off. That's when the fat line went dead. Then they began receiving a fat line message coming in from everywhere at the same time. It said, there will be no further misuse of this channel. You are disturbing others who are using it for serious purposes. Access will be restored when you understand what it is for. Goodbye. The council had his ship try to send out a fat line message, but they couldn't. So the council ship headed for Hyperion. Joseph was able to escape from the data sphere just before it collapsed. When the forecaster links were destroyed, the data sphere collapsed. And the megasphere also collapsed. It looked as if it was destroying itself. The methosphere, which is the void that binds, remains. And when it sent out a single message into the human universe, it convulsed. All the easy entrances that the web and the core provided were gone. Joseph was in the Hyperion portion of the methosphere. He could see the time tombs glowing in the methosphere. So that's where he headed. Saul was still at the steps of the Sphinx waiting. He sat there thinking about the technical UI and the human UI. He came to believe that the technical UI could never understand the human UI because it will never understand love. He still could not enter the Sphinx no matter how he tried. Then he saw a spaceship land next to him and three people got out. Then he heard shouting from down in the valley. He looked and he saw a person carrying another one in a fireman carry coming towards him. He didn't move. He was waiting for Rachel. Joseph got to Hyperion and the first thing he wanted to do was to visit the one that will be because he could see its brilliance. But he didn't do that. He went to the Sphinx instead. Watching the Sphinx from the void that binds, he saw it as energy. From his view, he saw several Sphinx. The one that was carrying the Shrike back in time. The one that contaminated Rachel. There was one that was moving forward in time and it was very bright. Only second to the one who will be. He went to it and he saw Saul hand his daughter to the Shrike. He couldn't stop that act even if he wanted to because a lot of worlds depended on that act. He watched as the Sphinx howling Rachel slowly walk past him. He couldn't do anything because he was insubstantial, but he could change the energies that held the Morbius cube intact. So he freed the erg that was in the Morbius cube. He communicated with the erg and it melded with him. 
he was now able to take Rachel from the Shrike. The Shrike spun around, but before he could do anything, it was pulled through the portal. But even with the Erg's help, he would not be able to get back to the entrance with Rachel. So he'd have to wait and see if someone came along. Meanwhile, Brani saw Martin's eyes widen. She spun around and saw the Shrike floating in mid-air behind her. Martin tells her to do something, and she says, ideas. And just then she heard a voice say, trust. And she looked down, and there's Moneta below her. Brani calls out for help, but all Moneta does is says, trust, and then disappears. The Shrike began to walk through the air as if it was on solid ground. Brani got up and faced the Shrike about five meters away in solid air, and she put her foot out in the air, and it seems like she was walking on a solid step. And she walked and faced the Shrike about 10 meters above the floor. She stepped forward and the Shrike embraced her. She then put her uninjured hand on the Shrike's chest and then it stopped. She then pushed the Shrike and it became brittle and turned into transparent crystal. And she pushed it again and this time it slid backwards and fell. It hit the floor and shattered into a thousand pieces. And as she began to crawl back on the invisible platform she was on, her confidence failed her and she fell twisting her ankle. She then hoisted Martin in a fireman carry and took him to the entrance. When he asked her about the others behind him, she said later. And as they were headed towards the Sphinx, they saw Sol standing in front of the entrance and something or someone was coming out of the Sphinx. Sol watched the figure come out of the Sphinx through the blazing light and it was a woman carrying an infant and it was his daughter Rachel as a young adult in her 20s and in her hands was the baby Rachel. After he greeted his adult daughter she said that the baby Rachel was aging normally. He asked her how was this possible. She said it's not for very long. By this time everyone had gathered around. The console, Theo, Milio, Martin and Brani. Milio knew it was Rachel. Brani knew it was Moneta. Rachel says she have only a minute or two here and she have much to tell you. Saul said, no, you have to stay. I want you to stay with me. Rachel said, I will stay with you, Dad, but only one of us can and she needs you more. Then she told them to listen. She told them her story about being chosen to be raised in the future where the final war raged between the cause UI and the human UI. She told them that it was a future where humans had spread across this galaxy and have traveled to other universes. When Martin said Colonel Kassad knew you as Moneta, she said, Will know me as Moneta. I have seen him die. I have accompanied his tomb to the past. I know that part of my mission is to meet him and to lead him forward to the final battle. But I haven't met him yet. She goes on to tell her father that she's going back in time because it is her role, her duty. They gave her the means to keep the Shrike in check and only she was prepared. When he told her that she wasn't raised in some mysterious world of the future, that she grew up in a small college town called Crawford on Barnard's world, she tells him she will grow up there. And then she told him, sorry, she has to go. She then told Milio sorry that to her it was a different life, literally. And she asked him if he is married with children. He said yes. She told her father that she loved him, and he asked her, how do I join you up there? And she says, for some, it will be a portal of time I spoke of, but that, it will mean raising me all over again. He asked her if there will be a time when the two of them will coexist. She says, no, she's going the other way now. And she said, you can't imagine the difficulty I had with the Paradox Board to get this one meeting approved. And he asked her, will they be alone up there? She says, no, not alone. There are wonderful people there, wonderful things to learn and do, wonderful places to see. Then she told him, wait a while before stepping through. It doesn't hurt, but once you're through, you can't come back. Then she stepped through the portal into the light and was gone. Before Saul and Rachel left, he found out that Brania was having a girl. He then wished everyone goodbye, and then he stepped into the light, and he and Rachel were gone. And as they were heading back now to the console's ship, they found the balalika that Father Hoyt used to play. The console began to play somewhere over the rainbow.
they headed toward the ship with all of them singing. Five and a half months later, the capital of Hyperion had been mostly rebuilt. Everybody called it Jacktown. Brawny, who was seven months pregnant, headed for the poet's city for the consul's farewell party. Once it was acknowledged that the web had collapsed and wasn't coming back, the consul and Theo had brokered a treaty for the co-management of the new Home Rule Council. The only traffic at the spaceport was the remnants of the force via dropship and excursions by the swarm. Brawny had been staying at Cicero's since Stan had rebuilt it. On the mountain where Sad King Billy's face was carved into, the other side they were carving Maynard Gladstone's likeness. When she got there, she was greeted by the consul and Martin. It wasn't only the consul who was leaving. Most of the force fleet was also going back, and so was a sizable portion of the ouster swarm. The ousters paid their last visit to the time tombs while the force officers stopped by Kassad's tomb. There was over a thousand people living in Poet's City now, and while Martin refused to run for mayor, he was the one running things. Later that night, they reminisced and talked about what the console will find when he gets to the web worlds. Hundreds of people have tried to enter the Sphinx in the past six months, and only one succeeded, an ouster. The Sphinx seems to be a one-way portal to the future. No one knew how it selected those who wished to pass. The Jade Tomb seemed to have something to do with gas giants, but no one had been able to get past its portal. The obelisk was still a mystery that nobody could solve. The crystal monolith had been resealed, and it was Colonel Kassad's tomb. The markings that were set in stone talked about a cosmic battle and a great warrior from the past who appeared to help defeat the Lord of Pain. The first and second of the cave tombs didn't lead anywhere, but the third appeared to open to labyrinths on different worlds. After a few researchers had disappeared never to return, the Ouster Research Authorities reminded the tourists that the labyrinths lay in different time, possibly hundreds of thousands of years in the past or the future, and they sealed it off except for qualified experts. The Shrike Palace was a mystery. The bodies that were in it were gone when Brani and the others returned, but there was a single door of light burning in the center, and anyone who stepped through it disappeared and nobody returned. There were three words on the Shrike Palace that they were able to translate. They said Colosseum, Rome, repopulate. So people began to believe that this portal opened up to the missing old earth and that the victims of the Tree of Thorns had been transported there. Later, while Brani and Martin was walking back to the poet city, she asked him, were you really on the tree or only stim simming in it while sleeping in the Shrike Palace? And he said, Probably both. Later, while she was walking in the garden by herself, Joseph appeared to her. They spoke for a while, and then he tells her, certainly the mother of the one who teaches can exercise some prerogatives. He goes on to tell her, the one who teaches, I have no idea what she will teach, but it will change the universe and set ideas in motion that will be vital 10,000 years from now. He goes on to tell her, that he only wishes that he could be around to find out what she teaches. When she asked him why, where will he be, he says the core is gone, the data spheres here are too small to contain him, except for the four ships, and he, do he doesn't like it there. When she asked him, and there's nowhere else, he said the metasphere, but it's filled with lions, tigers, and bears, and he's not ready. She gave him an idea that was to go and live in a consul's ship. The next day, of course, when the council is ready to go, his ship is sprouting poetry. Martin, of course, looks at Brania and figures out what she had done from her smile. Brania gave the council his grandfather's hawking mat that someone had found and she bought from them. Later, Brani and the others watched as the council ship took off. And that's how the novel ends. I want to thank everyone for watching and listening. Subscribe and give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.